know that most of what you've seen, read, or heard about Billy the Kid is untrue? My name is Gail Cooper. I'm a medical doctor and forensic psychiatrist. My specialty is murder case consultation for the defense. For 20 years, I've used my expertise to uncover the real Billy the Kid. Researching over 40,000 pages of archival documents and books, I've written the revisionist history. It's shocking, it's liberating, and I've written books demolishing the hoaxes, hijacking the history. My talks will share with you what I've found. Cover-ups, misinformation, and fakery, to use Old West lingo, will bite the dust. This talk debunks W.C. Jameson's and Frederick Bean's evidence for Brushy Bill Roberts being Billy the Kid in their 1998 book, The Return of the Outlaw, Billy the Kid. The information is from my book, Cracking the Billy the Kid Imposter Hoax of Brushy Bill Roberts. True believers, W.C. Jameson and Frederick Bean, in their 1998 book, the return of the outlaw Billy the Kid took on the brushy Bill imposter hoaxes, impassable hurdles of Billy Bonney's coroner's jury report and burial, Brushy's post-death scenes, absurd parade of Old West personas, and Brushy's pardon hearing failure as Billy the Kid. Their determination to convince readers made them cross the line from dupedom to deception. For the coroner's jury report, Jameson Bean made up that Fort Sumner's Justice of the Peace Alejandra Segura, quote, asked Milner Rudolph misspelled to assemble a coroner's jury and assume the role of foreman. Wrong. Segura appointed the jurymen, including Milner Rudolph, as he stated in the report. He wrote, on this 15th day of July A.D. 1881, I, the undersigned justice of the peace, received information that a murder had taken place in Fort Sumner and immediately proceeded to the said place and named Milner Rudolph, Jose Silva, Antonio Saavedra, Pedro Antonio Lucera, Lorenzo Jaramillo, and Saval Gutierrez, a jury, to investigate the case. Jameson and Bean made up that the body still lay on the floor for the coroner's jurymen. Their source was Charles Frederick Rudolph, Milner Rudolph's son, in his 1880 book, Los Bolitos, the story of Billy the Kid and his gang. But he didn't say that, accompanying his father to the inquest, giving no body location, he wrote, the coroner's jurymen met over the kid's body and with no argument or dissent, unanimously agreed on the following report given below. Jameson Bean also hid that he confirmed that Billy's body was identified by Garrett, Peter Maxwell, Delavina Maxwell, Luz Maxwell, townspeople, and the coroner's jury, whom he calls, quote, six honorable men who affixed their signatures and marks to the post-mortem of William Bonney, Billy the Kid. Jameson and Bean also recycled the morrison Sonishin scam in their 1955 book, Alias Billy the Kid, that no report ever existed because Morrison couldn't find it. They write snidely, for reasons never completely explained, this coroner's jury report never made it into the official records of San Miguel County. Morrison's trick had been looking for it in Las Vegas, New Mexico, instead of Santa Fe, where he knew it was found in 1932 and 1951. For the burial, Jameson and Bean hide the body's multiple identifications, calling it 
the body of the man killed by Sheriff Pat Garrett. They state that the body didn't match Billy. Their source is Billy's so-called obituary in a claim July 28th, 1881. It was really July 23rd. Silver City, Grand County Herald article titled Exit the Kid by S.M. Ashenfelter. They quote him as writing, since his escape from the Lincoln County Jail, the kid has allowed his beard to grow and has stained his skin brown to look like a Mexican. This article was apparently recommended by their secret backer, C.L. Sonishin, author of Alias Billy the Kid, in their June 25, 1991 interview with him. It's typical of the junk he used in his so-called historical research. In fact, Singleton M. Ashenfelter, owner of the New Southwest and Grand County Herald, hadn't written Billy's obituary, but merely a dime novel style article on July 23, 1881, titled Exit the Kid, the Fugitive Murderer Hunted Down and Killed by Sheriff Garrett. Positive Billy was the victim, but being in Silver City, 250 miles from the burial, he made up a bearded and stained dark disguised Billy. He also made up the shooting as near Fort Sumner, the deputy as John W. Coe, C-O-E, and Billy being 24. He also garbled information from the July 23rd Las Cruces Rio Grande Republicans, Kid the Killer Killed, William Bonney alias Antrim, alias Billy the Kid, fatally meets Pat Garrett, the Lincoln County Sheriff. That article also confirmed the victim as Billy. Excerpted, Ashenfelter's lurid fiction stated, the vulgar murderer and desperado known as Billy the Kid has met his just desserts at last. He was shot and killed in the house of Pete Maxwell near Fort Sumner, wrong, in Fort Sumner, at midnight Thursday the 14th instant by Sheriff Pat Garrett of Lincoln County. He was a native of New York City of Irish parentage and his real name was William McCarthy. Wrong, it was Henry McCarthy. Although he had been known as Henry Antrim, Billy Bonney, and other aliases, he lived in this city for some years with his mother, Mrs. Antrim, who has since died, and began his criminal life by acts of petty larceny. He escaped from jail here and grew from bad to worse. He was mixed up in the Lincoln County War. The general facts of his desperate career are well known and will not be recounted here. The fact is he was a low-down, vulgar cutthroat with probably not one redeeming quality. The circumstances of his taking oil were as follows. He had openly threatened Sheriff Pat Garrett's life. Hearing of his whereabouts, the sheriff with John W. Coe, it was Poe, P-O-E, and Kip McKinney proceeded to his rendezvous. At midnight, Garrett found the desperado's bed empty. After posting Coe and McKinney as guards outside, Garrett walked into the room. He saw Mr. Maxwell lying on the bed, and Garrett took a seat at the head of the bed. He was talking with Mr. Maxwell when someone came into the room. The figure advanced to the bed with a butcher knife in his hand. The visitor put his hand on the supposed sleeper to rouse him, and on Maxwell's rising up, he asked, having noticed the strange figure, who is that? The sheriff knew the voice instantly. Billy jumped away from the bed at the same time, drawing his self-cocking revolver. He had not got far from the bed when Garrett, who was always cool, rose up and fired. The shot struck the kid in the heart, and he fell on his back a dead man. Since his escape from the Lincoln jail, 
he had allowed his beard to grow and had stained his skin to look like a Mexican. This is the fake identity quote lifted by Jameson and Bean. He had been to the house of a friend that night for meat, and that explains the knife in his hand. And only in his 24th year, it was 21st year, he had been guilty of many murders. To be noted is that Jameson and Bean missed that their pretended authority, Ashenfelter, also confirmed Billy was the corpse and declared their man, Brushy, as Billy, a low-down, vulgar cutthroat with probably not one redeeming quality and guilty of many murders. They also missed that his bearded, stained dark Billy contradicted Brushy's punchline that Billy Barlow looked just like him, clean-shaven and fair, so was shot as mistaken for him as Billy the Kid. For Brushy's life after Billy's death, summarized this alias Billy the Kid's recounting of his hectically absurd travels and Wild West name-dropping. Jameson and Bean even tried to validate his fictions in their chapter titled Tracking William Henry Roberts, but they rationalized that his aliases made confirmations impossible. So they conclude slyly, we were unable to disprove any of Roberts' contentions. Brushy's Maybury pardon fiasco is rationalized as is being rattled by reporters, being scared by historical family members and alleged armed guards, being old and being rejected because his answers, quote, conflicted with accepted notions. Recycling Morrison's double talk they claim the pardon was refused without a legal hearing, omitting that Brushy had a hearing and was declared an obvious imposter. In the chapter, Evidence for and against William Henry Roberts as Billy the Kid, Jameson and Bean present physical similarities, special knowledge revelations, anecdotal evidence, and identification affidavits. They start with their conclusion. There exists a great deal of evidence that leads to conclusion for some that William Henry Roberts was, in fact, Billy the Kid. In reality, even his name as William Henry is fake. For physical similarities, Jameson and Bean repeat alias Billy the Kid's fabrications. For Billy's famous buck teeth, they cite the fake affidavit in alias Billy the Kid by Brushy's friend DeWitt Travers and partly written by Morrison, swearing he was Billy the Kid. See Talk 72, link below for the five fake affidavits. Jameson and Bean make up that DeWitt Travis claimed Brushy had, quote, two protruding front teeth until they were removed by a Gladewater, Texas dentist. In reality, Travis's December 12, 1951 affidavit stated that in 1931, the Gladewater, Texas dentist pulled, quote, a large tusk on each side of his upper jaw. During the year it took for Morrison to prompt Travis's writing that affidavit, Travis's had written to him on January 25, 1951, about that dentistry. Travis wrote, about Bill's teeth, the two eye teeth were so very big until they looked like tusks. They bothered him an awful lot so he had a Dr. Cruz in Gladewater take them out. Travis added, Bill was a better looking man after his teeth were taken out. So, DeWitt Travis really said that Brushy had abnormal eye or canine teeth which deformed his appearance. 
real Billy had protruding front or incisor teeth. Morrison apparently tacked on a reference to front teeth. To be noted also is that when Brushy's tusks were extracted in 1931, he would have been 52 or 72 in Billy the Kid years. So that deformity would have been present in Billy Bonnie's historical period. Obviously, it wasn't. In reality, DeWitt Travis's eyewitness report of tusk teeth was fatal to matching Brushy to Billy. Jameson and Bean add that Brushy's prominent ears matched Billy's, though that came from the tintype's right ear being pushed out by Billy's tilted hat brim. They hid Morrison's gaff about Brushy's deformed left ear made up from ignorance that tintypes are right to left reverse, so Billy's pushed out right ear appears to be his left. For Brushy's so-called revelations, Jameson and Bean present special knowledge tricks that convince them, but they add fix-ups. For example, by their day, it was clear that Brushy could read, so they modified the original so-called illiteracy for no reading up scam to calling him, quote, semi-literate who could barely read. They repeat his tale for Billy's letters. I had a friend who spelled it out in a letter for me what they wanted from Governor Wallace. Their evidence for Brushy's special knowledge is divided into what they call revelations about Lincoln, shooting black soldiers, a federal versus territorial indictment, and affidavits. The Lincoln revelations come from Brushy's prompting tour there with Morrison and are just two sites, the old Lincoln County Courthouse Jail and the McSween House. For the courthouse jail building, given is Brushy's reporting the commonly known later addition of stairs to the second story balcony. They also repeat and even diagram his wrong location of that building's armory as opposite Garrett's office when it was at the other end of the long hall. For the jailbreak, they cite his shackle slipping trick with striking Deputy Bell and his escape horse's rope fable, which parroted lying old timer and affiant Severo Giegos. Repeated is Brushy's parroting of Morrison's interview with Ahenio Salazar's adopted daughter, who told him that Ahenio cut off Billy's shackles. So, there are no revelations. The McSween House is used for so-called Lincoln County War revelations. Jameson and Bean wrote, Robert's intimacy with the layout of the McSween House and yard could only have come from personal experience. To be noted is that after its arson in the Lincoln County War battle, the house is gone. So, Brushy just claimed a kitchen window, a corral fence, and a wood pile, which Jameson and Bean call amazing. Added are Brushy's fake, quote, attacking Murphy man just across the river where no attackers were. Then quoted was Brushy's parody of Morrison's page from Billy's Dudley Court of Inquiry testimony about those escaping McSween's burning house. But for lack of the whole transcript, Brushy had missed Billy's key testimony about Commander Dudley's white soldiers firing a volley at those escaping that house, including him. So, there were no revelations. Also for the escape, Jameson and Bean fixed up Brushy's vile racism. In Alias Billy the Kid, he ranted, we opened the back door and looked out, just as Bob Beckwith and some of them N-words started to come in. Dishonestly sanitized, 
He now said, We opened the back door and looked out just as Bob Beckwith with some of those soldiers tried to rush us. Then, ignorant Jameson and Bean gushed that Fort Stanton's soldiers being black was unknown until Brushy reported it. They didn't know that his prompt source, Walter Noble Burns's 1926, The Saga Billy the Kid, stated, two squadrons of Negro cavalry with Colonel Dudley in command were soon moving at double quick on the road to Lincoln. Jameson and Bean also missed that Brushy didn't know that the black troops were mounted cavalry or that there were also white infantrymen and officers, or that Dudley brought along a terrifying Gatling gun and a howitzer cannon. They also missed that Brushy wrongly claimed that black soldiers fired from the South foothills. So there were no revelations. Often also are little revelations. Brushy's statement about the Messiah trial having its federal indictment thrown out recycles Morrison's original special knowledge trick. Jameson and Bean didn't know that Brushy just parroted Billy's April 15, 1881 letter to attorney Edgar Capeless from the Messiah jail. Billy wrote, my United States case was thrown out of court. Since Billy didn't name the case or why it was thrown out, Brushy didn't know either. In reality, as Billy would have known, it was the Buckshot Roberts case filed as federal because the Blazers Mill killing site was within the federally controlled Mescalero Indian Reservation. But that was an error since Blazers Mill was private property, thus under territorial law. So, Judge Bristol was forced to quash the Buckshot Roberts indictment for wrong jurisdiction. So, there was no revelation. Brushy's statement about the Jim Carlisle killing is called a revelation. Jameson and Bean were unaware that he simply parroted Billy's December 12, 1880 letter to Lou Wallace about the Jim Carlisle killing, so there was no revelation. Brushy's tale about post-capture trading the Billy the Kid tintype for a scarf from an Indian girl at the Maxwell House is called a revelation. But Jameson and Bean were ignorant that it was a fiction Brushy lifted from Walter Noble Burns' 1926 book, The Saga of Billy the Kid. So there was no revelation. Jameson and Bean then present what they call anecdotes proving Brushy was Billy. They miss that unnamed people's hearsay isn't evidence and that their five tales are silly. One, once, in a Heiko, Texas street, a mother called to her child, Billy, and Roberts turned. Jameson and Bean forgot that he said his name was Brushy Bill and William Henry, so being called Billy is expected. Two, in 1990, a Pinkerton detective's grandson said, in 1945, his grandfather called to Brushy, Bonnie, misspelled, you're under arrest. If it really happened, it proves that in 1945, there were at least two Texas eccentrics. Three, in 1983, a Texan wrote a letter saying that Garrett's blind daughter told him Pat did not shoot Billy. This demonstrates why hearsay is meaningless. Four, Eugenio Salazar is cited as believing Billy wasn't killed. That's true, but he had no first-hand knowledge. His belief came from a visit 
he got years after the killing from a school teacher from Mexico, not brushy. Five, in 1948, someone told someone in Las Cruces, New Mexico, that Billy was not shot by Garrett because he saw him in Mexico in 1914. He knew Billy, he said, when they lived in Silver City from 1868 to 1871. In reality, Billy lived in Silver City from 1873 to 1875. Silver City didn't exist in 1868 and Billy was 33 years dead in 1914. Then Jameson and Bean present the hoax's original five fake affidavits swearing Brushy was Billy, three by non-historical people, and two by Brushy's friends as presented in full in Alias Billy the Kid. See Talk 72, link below, for debunking the affidavits. Jameson and Bean wrap up with evidence against William Henry Roberts as Billy the Kid. They make up, quote, the only available evidence for Billy the Kid being shot and killed in Fort Sumner in 14 April 1881 is the word of Pat Garrett. So they conclude the case for Roberts being Billy the Kid is considerably stronger than the case against it. In reality, they had presented zero evidence for Brushy being Billy the Kid. The next talk debunks the return of the outlaw Billy the Kid's fake photo comparison of Brushy Bill to the Billy the Kid tintype.